nation's favourite antiques experts. Let's get fancy. Behind the wheel of a classic car. I'm always in turbo. And a goal to scar Britain for antiques. Hot stuff. The aim, to make the biggest profit at auction. <gasps> but it's no mean feat. There'll be worthy winners. Cha-ching. Oh, my goodness. And valiant losers. <laughs> Bonkers. Will it be the high road to glory? You are my ray of sunshine. Oh, stop it. Or the slow road to disaster. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> This is Antiques Road Trip. Yeah. Hello, the Lake District, and a big hello to a new road tripper. Is she? Welcome to the Antiques Road Trip. Oh, hey. yeah, thank you so much. Joining Wiltshire auctioneer Izzy Barmer is a new recruit, yet old hand in the antiques business, Ishi Khan. It's a little bit niche in the antiques market, but there are some really beautiful things to find and look at. I personally think it's the best part of antiques is the jewellery. Oh, Everyone too. loves some gemstones and gold. I mean, I'm really looking forward to being with someone who also loves jewellery. Yeah. Jewellery loving Ishi and Izzy, a perfect combination. Oh, I'm so excited to be doing this Thank road you. trip with you. I'm so excited too. No, have you been swatting up? I don't want to be on the back foot here. <laughs> you definitely won't be. <laughs> I wouldn't be so sure, Izzy. Jet setting London native Ishi is a regular at antiques fairs from New York to Miami, so should be a dab hand at picking out diamonds in the rough. So, gold or silver? Gold. You? Gold. Yeah. Izzy's also got a trick or two up her sleeve for antiques hunting success. So do you have any morning rituals before you set out for a day of buying? I always paint my nails in the morning. It just sort of like gets me in the zone and calms my mind. So I've done my nails today. Yeah, I saw them. <gasps> Is she? I've done them wrong. <laughs> I was trying to alternate them yeah. and have like sort of dark pink, light pink. And I just realised on this hand I've got two next to each other the same colour. I think it's an omen for today. No! It's <laughs> You need to seize the day, seize issue. The day. Yeah. It's, my, it's my chance. Speaking of striking lucky, our pair will be going for gold this week in a vintage 1973 Volvo P1800. Very nice indeed. So, Ishi, are you a fan of vintage cars? I am. They look gorgeous. The, the only issue is I haven't driven manual in a long time since I passed my test, so oh. I'm a little bit nervous about it. So how are you finding the drive? Well, she drives absolutely beautifully. The only thing I would say is putting her into reverse is yeah. very difficult. The steering wheel's massive, so I'll hopefully be able to fit in. Well, we won't get very far if you can't, my dear boy. Kicking off in Cumbria, this pair will point their motor to Lancashire, cross the border to Yorkshire, then down to Derbyshire, and off to a final auction in Leicester. The scenery is gorgeous as well. Oh, I think that's one of the... What I love about doing this is you've got to drive these incredible cars and you get to drive them through such beautiful countryside. This leg takes a circuitous route through the Lake District to park up and watch an auction take place in Leyland. But all the excitement begins in Kendall, the gateway to the lakes. They're visiting the Antiques Emporium, where Ishi will have his first chance to get his hands on some treasure. Right, you two, keep your peepers peeled because this place is packed with stuff to tempt you to part with your £200. <laughs> Come on, playtime's over. It's time to get in those cabinets. There's a set of four of these. I think they might be asparagus dishes. So these will be 19th century, so um, we, if, if they're made in the UK, you could call them Victorian. And they're in the blue and white, which was very popular during the 19th century. You've got the oriental um, sort of bonsai type tree amongst some more... It actually looks like a ruined um, abbey or something on there. These are priced at £170, so being shop one, First buy yet to happen. I don't really want to splash the majority of my cash on one item. I'm not that brave. Very smart indeed, Izzy. Now, how's our new boy getting on? Oh, wow, now this is quite cool, actually. So this is a really old school kitchen table utensil used to make marmalade. And if you turn it around, yeah, it should say here. As you can see, it's quite heavy, actually. <laughs> so it says, Follows and bait, patented marmalade cutter, Manchester. Founded in 1868, the engineering company made everything from paint grinding machinery to early lawnmowers and mechanical kitchen appliances, of course. The thing I love about this is it's actually like 
a really ornamental piece that has function. So if you cleaned it up, you could actually use it to make your preserves and marmalades. Could have some mileage at auction. Maybe it will be a cut above. <laughs> How's our veteran doing? Going to be honest, not entirely sure what this is. It's silver, which is why I've honed in on it. Now the label says it's a silver bottle collar. And quite conveniently, there's a bottle here. You'd think that top bit would sit a bit more flat or a bit more flush, wouldn't you? And then I guess if it is a bottle collar, you'd put a card in or something here saying what it is, but I don't really understand how that would work. I think you're right, it's not a bottle collar. Could be part of a chatelaine, some sort of decorative belt hook. It's hallmarked for Birmingham and I would say, again, without my loop, that that looks like a little C, so that's likely to be about 1902, 1903. It's priced at £38. I mean, hey, this could be something really rare and valuable. I think that might be worth a little punt. Banking on a mystery object, eh? Now that's what I call brave. Now, what's Ishi found? Now, this is a beautiful object here. It's called an apern. You can set the scene 1920s, 1930s, filled with fresh flowers and decorating the table, everyone in their flapper dresses and smart suits. This one's electroplated silver, and then these are cut crystal, and they are removable, and you just easy to clean as well if they're removable, and you just place them inside and put your finishing touches to the table. If we got it cleaned up, I reckon this could potentially do quite well at auction. If this was sterling silver, you could expect a price tag well into the hundreds, possibly even thousands. The ticket price is marked at £49.95. It's a little bit higher than I think it would achieve at auction, so we'll see if there's a little bit of room in it. Time to see the nice gentleman at the till. Hi, Chris. How are you? It's a wonderful shop you've got here. Thank you. So, I spotted this marmalade cutter. You wouldn't put your fingers in there. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a ticket price of £38. £38. I just wanted to see what's possible on it. Very best I can do is about £34. Okay, perfect. So the second item was this Apern, this beautiful object, and it's got a ticket price of £49.95. Um, I think we could probably do 42 so we'll do £76 in total for the pair. Yeah, that's fine by me. That would be great. Thank you very much. OK, you're welcome. What a genteel first deal from Ishi, eh? We'll see how long that lasts. He's bagged himself two lots and still has £124 in the kitty. First shop down. Let's see what's next. That's our rookie off the mark and Izzy has cash burning a hole in her pocket too. Christopher! Oh, hello. Steady on, Izzy. You've nearly finished him off. I'm going very formal. I found something that... Ah. It says on the label it's a silver bottle collar. I'm mm -hmm. not convinced. I think that that would slit, slit on to, slat on to, like, a belt, but then I don't know what happens here. Told you. But you're the expert. I was going to let you tell me. My hunch is it isn't a bottle collar, but I don't... I think it's part of something, but I'm not sure what. Anyway, <laughs> I mean, this... <laughs> really, what, what I'm coming round to... It's a talking to, point. It's a talking it point. It is. And it's a very long-winded way of saying, it's £38. Please, can I have some money off it? You could have it for 34 I can have it for 34 Can I squeeze you at all for any more? Just because I think it might be part of something. I'll do 30 for you. Chris, you are an absolute gent. Thank you very much. Very well played indeed. And with that, she's off with £170 left. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ishi is taking in the scenery and heading for the town of Bowness on Windermere. He's come to find out more about pioneering children's author and illustrator Beatrix Potter. While Peter Rabbit needs little introduction, not many know of the remarkable life of the woman who created him. Sarah Mel Hewish has researched the author's legacy. Hi, Sarah. Oh, How hi. are you? Hi, very good, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you. Even good. better for being here. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, you can really see why it inspired so many writers and like, artists. It's absolutely incredible. I know. Sitting here looking at this view, you can really see why they were so inspired to write. Um, Beatrix Potter and Wordsworth particularly are, are hugely famous in this area and, and inspired by the landscape and everything they did. It would be great to find out a little bit more. Yeah, let's Perfect. go. 
Beatrix Potter was born in London in 1866, where she was educated by governesses without many children for company. She had numerous pets and holidayed in the rugged Lake District landscape, taking inspiration from its flora and fauna as she flourished into a talented artist and storyteller. At a time when women faced great constraints, Potter was determined to be an author and illustrator. Snubbed by publishers, she paid for the first copies of The Tale of Peter Rabbit to be printed, capitalising on the market boom in children's books. I think it was really the golden era for children's literature then. The start of Beatrix Potter's 23 stories, she started with Peter Rabbit and carried on writing another 22 stories which people have grown to love over the years and is a fantastic set of fantasy stories based on Lake District wildlife and landscape. As well as being a pioneering author, Potter was a canny businesswoman. In 1903, she made a Peter Rabbit doll, which was released onto the market, followed by painting books, board games, blankets and even wallpaper. And Beatrix Potter really was quite savvy for her generation. She was a trailblazer, she was a feminist, she was an amazing illustrator and she was quite switched on and she she patented Peter Rabbit very early on and started making merchandise pretty much straight away. My generation, we grew up with the film and TV. Was that a later thing or was that was she approached earlier on? I think she was certainly approached by Disney early on and turned that down. Wow. But as you know, there's been quite a few different things over the last few years, TV series and films, which people have enjoyed and all just keep people interested in the, the characters and finding out more about the mischievous rabbit. I mean, it's incredible to turn Disney down. <laughs> yeah. Not many people can say that. Potter's 23 children's books and spin-off games and wares earned her notoriety and vast personal wealth. It was with the proceeds of the book and her merchandise that she managed to buy so, much, so many farms in the Lake District and keep that legacy and the Lake District protected for future generations. Potter was a passionate conservationist and to prevent the Lakeland landscape she cherished being lost to urbanisation, she bought up 4,000 acres, including 15 farms, which she bequeathed to the National Trust upon her death. Her books have now sold more than 250 million copies, so alongside capturing children across the globe's imaginations for generations, she's preserved this beautiful part of the world for us all to enjoy as she did. What a woman Beatrix Potter was. And speaking of women driving under their own steam, here comes our Izzy on her way to another shop. I have to say, I think he bought by far the better items this morning. So, um, uh, based on that alone, I think Ishi might be winning this road trip. But hey, it's early days, so it's all to play for, as they say. Couldn't have put it better myself. Izzy's en route to Grangeover Sands, a town on the north side of Morecambe Bay. Popular Victorian seaside resort, it gained its over sands suffix when a local vicar got sick of his post going to Grange in Borrowdale near Keswick. <laughs> Izzy's visiting Grange Emporium, which is chock full of collectibles and vintage paraphernalia, and she's still got £170 at her disposal. Oh, hello. Well, they're a really rather lovely striking colour, aren't they? They're only vintage, but they're a nice quality because they're hand-blown. We've got six of them. Things like this, certainly... Um, I was going to say certainly with my generation, but you could use them for anything. You could, you know, you could... You could have a gin and tonic out of them. Now you're talking. I'd love it if they were signed. They're not. Certainly mid-20th century glass, uh, Italian glass and Scandinavian glass, that can be extremely collectible. Because they're not always signed, you can pick them up really cheaply. They're priced at £20. I mean, to be honest with you, I'm, I, I'm, I've sort of fallen in love with them. But I know I need to have a look around and see what else is in here. So park them for now. That's one possible then. Who's this character? Shake with Uncle Sam. Only 25 cents. He will tell you the strength of your personality. Will you now, Sam? Let's find out then. Hot stuff! <laughs> 
I always knew you were a firebrand, Arizzi, and always with something sweet to bring to the table, too. This is a, um, it's a sugar bowl, and it's a novelty sugar bowl because the, the supports are formed of golf clubs, and then we've got the sifter spoon here, which has got a golf ball finial. So this would have contained loose sugar, pop in the spoon and, I guess, pop over your strawberries. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the purpose of the, of the glass golf ball inside is. I can only presume it's to stop the sugar from clumping together. I was hoping it would be silver plated. It doesn't actually say EPNS or anything on the base. There are no marks at all. It could be as early as sort of 1930s-ish, but it also could be quite a bit younger. I mean, there is a lot of wear to it, so that would indicate that, well, it's, it would indicate it's been over polished, but also that it's got some decent age to it. It would look great on your table. It's a talking point. It's 50 pounds, which is quite a bit more than I would want to pay for it. Time to see how generous shopkeeper Helen's feeling. Helen! Hi! Helen, so I've had a good look around and I've got very distracted with all the fabulous clothing, um, but I've found two items and I haven't really decided if I'm going to get one or both and it basically just, I think, if I'm really honest, depends on the price. Right. So I'm hoping, woman to woman, we can do something here. No problem. I can knock your five off them blue glasses, so you've got six for 15 quid. Amazing. And the golf ball sugar ball, I could do that for 30. Can I be really cheeky and knock you off any more? So we do 40 for the two. So it's 25 and 15. That sounds amazing. You are a wonderful woman. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Very generous indeed. Those two lots have left Izzy with £130 still to spend. And just like that, today's shopping is done. Time to pick up Ishi and motor on. I actually love to have one day. I mean, this will never ever happen, but like a pink diamond or something. Yeah, we, we um, never know. We might find one in a shop one never, day. You never like, know. Not from me. I won't be able to tell it's pink. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I can't believe you're colour blind. Yeah. How on earth do you do your job being colour blind? It's a, it's a struggle. Let's just say everything has to be tested by a lab. Deary me. Good job I have test tubes and microscopes at the ready. Nighty night. Morning. We're back on the road with our jolly jewellery experts. I brought my good luck ring, oh. so I wear that for good luck. And it's a beautiful then, uh, ring. Does it bring you. you luck as well? <laughs> we'll see at the end of this week. And another glorious day in the lakes lies ahead of us. Enjoying so this beautiful weather today. Would you really call the rain beautiful? I've got to stay positive. Yeah. <laughs> That's the spirit. I think you were just pretending that you can't drive manual cars. I mean, it has been ten years, so... And this isn't the easiest gearbox. It's not. So. Is, it, is it a bit like riding a bike, though? Is it coming back to you? I don't know. You haven't seen me ride a bike yet. He might be getting to grips with the Volvo, but yesterday Ishi put pedal to the metal on his first two purchases, a marmalade cutter. That's actually beautiful in itself as an object. And an apern. This one's electroplated silver, and then these are cut crystal. Leaving him with £124 today. Izzy went on a bit of a spree. This could be something really rare. Picking up a set of hand-blown glasses. Well, they're a really rather lovely striking colour, aren't they? A novelty sugar bowl. It's got some decent age to it. And what Izzy has now identified as a Chatelaine clip spectacle case collar, <laughs> which is missing its spectacle case, leaving her with £130 in the kitty. I've made an absolute boo-boo. Surely it's not that bad. No, it is. <laughs> I have indeed bought a broken, totally pointless, useless item. Well, I mean, I'll keep an eye out today for a spectacles case. Yes, Maybe that, we can put it in as a joint lock. That would be so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it's sure a disaster. Oh, dear. What was that you were saying about thinking positively? I think you're making me feel better about my first day, actually, <laughs> but... Ishi's dropped off Izzy and is now en route to Cartmel, a quaint village with ancient roots dating back to 677 AD. Ishi's stopping by Cartmel Village Vintage, which has two floors of eclectic antiques and has £124 still to spend. What's not to love? A cabinet full of jewellery is always a nice thing to see. This is a really beautiful object. It's a monogram locket with enamelled detail. To me, it doesn't look like gold. And the reason for that is it's just there's some 
slight rubbing where the gilding has worn away probably circa 1880 in age so it's lived a long life got a ticket price of 48 pounds which is brilliant for what it is and the age it's got I just worry it might get looked over at auction because it isn't a gold so I'm not sure I want to take the risk on this particular piece very sensible too a chat with Donna the dealer might be an idea we've got a few bits that came in yesterday Looks it's, like a jewellery box. It's, it's a mix. It's a mixed bag. Did you know I was coming? Well, must have done. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> That's actually really beautiful. A travelling case, maybe. Yeah, perfect to put in your bag when you're going <laughs> on holiday. Yeah, yeah. Let's take a look at these. Looks like a sterling silver button hook. Yeah, yeah. It's for shoes. Shoe oh, shoes. That's really interesting. We've got four different brooches. Right. That's, That's that a is... ruby in it. So I have tested that. Really? Mm. That's beautiful. Mm. So that's a kiwi bird, mm. do you reckon? I think so. It's got the beak. Yeah. <laughs> then we've got a RAF brooch. And then we've got baby brooch. Enamelled again. It's actually really nice enamel as well, yeah. so... And probably silver, that one. Yeah, that sterling silver marked in the back. Yeah, yeah. CH for Charles Horner? Oh, I'm not sure. Possibly, it could be. Could be a Horner. Fisk. The much collected Victorian silversmith. Nice. And then we've got a... Uh, Nice little brooch. It's it's Irish glass. It's just a Czechoslovakian glass. Beautiful. 1930s. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, and then finally we've got a little cheroot holder. That's really fun. Curious, what's the best you would be able to do on this? Well, for you, I think we could do all of those for £25. There's a lot of potential for £25. I think so. I'm actually surprised. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a happy surprise. I know, well, because it's your first road trip we want you to do well that's very sweet yeah. of you i mean with four brooches i don't know if izzy's going to retain her title as queen of the brooches she's losing, she's losing so it, there's a little bit of competition <laughs> gonna happen Absolutely. our jewelry expert has struck gold thank you yeah, so good. much i really appreciate oh, it not bad for your first solo rodeo is she that impressive haul leaves you 99 pounds to play with thank you so much take care see you soon and while our rookie motors on Izzy has made her way out of Cumbria into Lancashire and to Wharton. This sleepy village not too far from Lancaster, with its quaint cottages and 15th century church, is quintessentially English. However, every 4th of July, the iconic star-spangled banner flies high and tours of friends from across the pond make the pilgrimage to be here. Because what many of us Brits don't know is that Wharton holds a very important connection to the history of the United States and one Americans hold dear. Local historian Simon Williams picks up the story. Hello, Simon. Hello, Izzy. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, but what an unusual name for a pub here in rural England. I know there's a piece of history here in this name and it's something that we're very proud of in this village of Wharton. Uh, do you want to find out more? Well, I'd love to. We'll go to that church behind us. The answer's in the church. In the church. Intriguing. The pub's namesake was, in 1789, sworn in as the first president of the United States of America. As one of the seven founding fathers, George Washington was instrumental in establishing the first large-scale republic in the modern world, and his ties to the village go back centuries before his birth. If you look back at the Washingtons, who were the predecessors of George Washington, Walton has the claim to more of them than any other place. What impact did the Washingtons have locally? Uh, well, not least, they actually took a hand in the building of this church and were responsible at least for the tower, one of the oldest parts of the church. And in the 1400s, that tower was built. And for a long time, the crest of the Washington family uh, was on the outside of the tower, and that's how we know. And it was only in more recent years that that was brought inside uh, because it was weathering. In the 1600s, many Brits emigrated to the States, primarily to escape religious persecution and prosper in the New World colonies. John um, Washington, in his 20s, I think he was aged 23, in the 1650s, sailed to America to seek his fortune. He became a planter um, and a tobacco grower, and eventually, three generations later, George Washington, future president, was born. Tell me more about who he was before he became president of America. He starts as a surveyor in Virginia, uh, which meant he had to travel the county and got to know the people. 
uh, built up enough of fortune to uh, become a planter and a merchant in his own right, exporting tobacco. Um, but he also gained military experience fighting the French in the 1760s. Uh, it's thought he would probably was a better leader of men than uh, a, a tactician or strategist. Mm -hmm. he, he took the advice of others, it is said, uh, when he fought those wars. The Washington crest that stood prominently on the church tower since the family built it in the 1400s now has pride of place in the church's kitchen, just next to the coffee machine. So this is it? Yes, this, this is the coat of arms of the Washington family. Here is the coat of arms. But the interesting thing about this is, chill down the spy moment, when you realise the coat of arms is three stars and two bars. They're stars and stripes. So what you're saying is George Washington might have made some suggestions to put his family crest within the flag of America and he's completely immortalised his family. It's a nice thought. Uh, there is no evidence to say that that really is what happened. Bit of I a think... coincidence though, isn't it? <laughs> I think a lot of historians <laughs> would uh, raise their eyebrows. But yes, it's a nice coincidence. Well I, like, well, I like that story a lot. And do you know what I love? I absolutely love that it's here on the wall, you know, the crest of the family of one of the most famous men. And it's right here in the kitchen. You could just be making yourself a cup of coffee while stood there next to that. I mean, what a piece of history. Fascinating stuff indeed. While Izzy's been getting a history lesson, Ishi's focused on matters at hand. I've bought some kitchen alias, some tableware and some jewellery, so I'm not too sure what I'm looking for next. I've seen in some shops there's been some like old school games and like chess boards and domino sets, so maybe something like that that could appeal to collectors of those items and yeah, maybe something that's got a bit of a niche interest. How intriguing. Well, there's no time like the present. Ishi's tooling across the border of North Yorkshire to the town of Ingleton, situated at the foot of one of the famous three peaks of the Dales. Nestled in the prehistoric landscape lies Lord's Antiques and Salvage. It doesn't get much more antique than dinosaurs, does it? <laughs> well, quite. And with more than 75 stalls, it's a veritable cornucopia of antiques and collectibles. It's actually quite overwhelming how much stuff there is to see here, so I'm just trying to take it all in and see if I spot something special. Just spotted this set of magic lantern slides, and I find these fascinating. Now we have social media to show off where we've been back then. This was probably the closest they got to seeing all these interesting things around the world. Now, as lovely and interesting as these are, they are quite common, so I don't think they're going to fetch a huge premium at auction, so it's not something I'll be buying, but they are fascinating to look at and really, really special objects. On guard. Now, there's not many things that I would mess up my hair for, but this is pretty cool. So not only is this a beautiful decorative item, it's actually a functional fencing mask made by a company called Leon Paul, based in Monmouth Street, London. A French fencing master in the First World War. Leon Paul set up a training studio and supply shop in Covent Garden, and the company is still going today. They were established in 1920, so it's not antique antique, but this could be a winner at auction. So if Ishi can sabre himself some money on it, that purchase will be en point. <laughs> Half an hour away, Izzy's bound for Khan Forth, the market town whose train station was the setting of Sir David Lean's classic film, Brief Encounter. For Izzy's last bite of the shopping cherry, she's alighting at Vintage and Country, home to a bevy of antiques and curios, and she has £130 left in the budget. Well, I haven't seen a shoemaker's last in donkey's years. A last? It's a last. It's a shoe last. But it's like... Never mind. Oh, how very troll. Well, this is quite nice. It's a cigarette case. And what I like about this is you've got this really beautiful burr wood top. It's probably a burr walnut. 
uh, and it's also likely to be a veneer, but I think it's a really beautiful piece of wood. But I like the idea that you could use it to display your jewellery or you could pop a few trinkets. And if I'm really honest, it's not hugely old either. It's a contender, but it does depend on the price. I'll have a little look around and see what else I come across. A dirty habit, but could it clean up at auction? One for the maybe pile. I'm sort of tempted by the teaching aid. These are really popular, but I thought more so when they were of the human body. And this one is a spider, a crayfish, and a starfish. Well, it's really hard to know if this is original or not because it's inside, it's a protective cover. It's 90 pounds, so that's pretty much half my budget. It wouldn't be worth getting if it is just a reproduction. Then for this teaching aid, it's so long, and thanks for all the fish. Oh, look at these. Ishi's 18 miles east in Ingleton. How cool are these? All right, Izzy, I'm ready for the fight. How cool would they look, like in a man cave or a woman cave even? I love them, I think they're brilliant. I've just spotted this as well, it says, there's 35% off everything on this stall. So we know there's a little bit of room for movements. Okay, so the ticket price is 190 pounds. So even with 35% off, I think these are gonna be out of my budget, even though I love them. You'll have to box very clever to get that one past the dealer, dear boy. Time for plan B. There's some really interesting boxes here. The funnest thing about this is the mystery aspect of this. So it's a locked box with a padlock that appears to not have a key and it's only 10 quid plus 35% off. So this is an absolute bargain. So that's the mask, gloves and a locked box of mystery. Better talk to Breton, the dealer. Hi, Breton. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sorry to catch you off. That's all right. It's been incredible looking around here. There's so many cool things to see. Oh, cool, thank you. So I spotted a really cool fencing mask and it's got a ticket price of 30 quid on it. Just yeah. curious, what's the best on that? We're feeling, feeling generous, so we'll do 25 on it if okay. that was any good to you. Perfect. So I've got 99 quid. There. 99 pounds. Yeah, right, okay. so I don't presume there's any chance we can do the gloves in the box for 99, is there? No. So. I, really, I like your style, but I can't at all. <laughs> I feel I really cheeky asking. No, no, no. no. I've, hey, I've had worse offers. <laughs> Trust me, I really have. Sorry. Thank you for trying. No, it's so, OK. I think in that case, we're going to have to go for the mask and the locked box. You're hoping for the gold bar, in it? Yeah. <laughs> I should have opened it. So £10, less you 35%, so it's £6.50 plus um, 25 so it's £31.50. Thank you so much. I no. really do appreciate it. Well done, Ishi. Two out of three ain't bad. And with £67.50 left in the kitty, jobs are good un. So that's our rookies' purchases in the bag. Down the road, though, Izzy's still on the hunt. Age is difficult to assess. I would have thought that I think they're definitely 20th century. I think they look older than they are. Yeah. Folk art can be tricky to date, and this pair of naively carved hardwood miniature paddles are just that. But what's drawn me to them is you've got these sort of funny, quirky little faces and they've got these little mushroom hats on. They're not priced, so it really does depend on their price. But, I mean, just look at those faces. Who could say no to those? Right, time to see the De Laval. Hello. I think everything in here is ticketed except for the bits I've picked up. Of course. <laughs> Naturally. Your table cigar case. Oh, yes. And perhaps they're juggling sticks. The cigar box is 35. Uh-huh. And the little juggling paddles are about 50. Oh, OK. Can we do something on those prices? Where am for I at? Both of them. Pretend, oh, let's say yes at this stage, yes. 55 for the two. Can I push you down at all anymore? 50. Do you know what? That seems very fair. Yes, please, that would be lovely. OK. Thank you very much. Let's call it £30 for the paddles and £20 for the cigarette box, leaving Izzy £80 left unspent. Time to rejoin her travel companion. That's it, Ishi. <laughs> we've, we've done all we can now. I did find something that kind of played into what I like and enjoy. So... It's in the hands of the gods now. Yeah, the unknown is a little yeah. bit exciting. Sleep tight. Morning. 
Our pair are in Leyland, recently voted one of the top ten friendliest towns to live in Britain, so an amiable place for our experts to do battle. They started their travels in the Lake District, bounced about a couple of counties and landed up in Lancashire. The lots they've rested their hopes on are going under the gavel at Warren and Wignall Auctioneers, a third-generation family business going strong since 1966. Buyers will be on the phones, online and in the sale room. The man wielding the gavel is James Warren. Ishi splashed out £132.50 on five lots. What are James's top picks of his purchases? We have a Victorian cast iron marmalade cutter. It's quite a nice one. Now the fencing mask, it's an old one, early 20th century, labelled by the maker, which is nice. And Izzy parted with £120 on her five. What do you reckon then, James? This is quite cute. It's got little golf club support around the outside and it even comes with a crystal golf ball too. My favourite lot are the folk art paddles. We don't know where they're from and it will be interesting to see what they go for on the day. It most certainly will and it's almost time to drop the hammer. Here we go. This is exciting. I feel like this is a moment of Antiques Road Trip history for you because yeah. this is your very first auction. No, I'm excited to see how it works, what happens and how our lots do. There's lots to be excited about at today's auction. Getting proceedings under the way is Ishi's locked stained wooden box. I just thought the added mystery, the lock, thought someone might be interested in it and might get a bit carried away. With bids at £2 only on the web. Five and eight now bid. Double figures perhaps for this. 10 and 12 and 15. 18 now bid. Is it 20 pounds? No way. At 18 we're bid on the web then. Is it 20? At 18 pounds. Fair warning at 18. That must be the beginner's luck. Whatever it is, selling for nearly three times the purchase price is jolly good going. That's a great return. Thank you. That's what I was kind of hoping for. I thought maybe someone will take a chance in it. And you've made a proper profit. First one. <laughs> Up next, Izzy's Art Deco cigarette box. You could put chocolate wafers inside. Oh, my God, that's such a great idea. <laughs> After dinner. I think that's what it is. It's not a cigarette box, it's a chocolate wafer box. Five at the desk, is it eight online? Oh. Ten bid on the web, is it 12 now? At ten pounds, we're bid on the web at ten. Are we done? And 12, new bid. Oh, yeah, good. Is it 15? Quickly now, is it 15 bid? Come is on. it 18 on this one? Fair warning. Oh, no. And we'll sell. At £15. Oh. If only the buyers knew it could be used for after dinner chocolate wafers instead. <laughs> Didn't do too bad. Never mind. Win some, you lose some. Yeah, we've got some more lots to go. That's true. Our rookie's in the lead, and up next, it's the cast iron marmalade cutter. At £30 straight in here, I'll go 32 online, I'm out. 32 will bid on the web. Anyone in the room at 35? We're selling on the web at 32. On the web. Made a small loss. Not terrible enough to be bitter about. <laughs> hey, do you know what? That's practically breaking even. This is turn now with the folk art miniature paddles. Pay £30 for them and I could really do with a profit. Paddles, there they are. Shall we say 10 for those? 10 were bid on the web. 12 anymore. Are we sure then at £10? 12 bid. This is not my day. Is it 15? Yes, we're still going. And 18 bid now, is it 20? OK, it is better than them selling at 10. Are we done? Are we sure? At 18 they sell. <sighs> That's a shame. Oh, well. I really well. thought they could go well. A wise man once said, you can't win them all. Some people have got some absolute bargains today. They have, haven't they? Yeah. You're very upbeat about this. You're, what a surprise that you're upbeat <laughs> about all of my losses. <laughs> it ain't over till it's over, and up next is Ishi's vintage fencing mask. Did you put it on? Did your hair fit under it? <laughs> it was a tight fit. Eight pounds with me. Ten, who's coming in on this? No more, are we sure? Ten takes it away online Ooh. then at ten pounds. Are we done for ten then? Fair warning at ten pounds. I loved it, so someone got a good bargain for that piece. Exactly. Ah, oh, aren't they a couple of sweethearts? With that, Izzy's edged into the lead. She just has an object to put in your house. Yeah. It just I thought it was so cool and interesting and different. Time for Izzy's set of six hand-blown glasses. I mean, I paid £15 for them. I, I would be sad if they didn't make a profit on that. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Got five and eight at the desk, is it ten for these? At eight pounds, ten. Take some online away from my bids then, at ten pounds. And twelve, new bidder on the web. Come on, bid on the let's web break even. £12 then, and fifteen still going. 
at £15. And they go at £15. No profit. <laughs> you shouldn't feel too blue about that one. Do you know what? That's my highest achievement today, so <laughs> yeah. I'll take that. Is she now? With the tooled leather jewellery box, brooches and cheroot holder. It's a really lovely lot. I'm hopeful it will do well. With 32, we're bid. For you, we're in for Yeah. At £32, we're bid now. Any advance? At 32 I mean, it's a profit. It's a profit, so... It's a massive bargain for whoever got it, but it is a profit. That lovely collection of items just put our new recruit back in the lead. The way that our items are going today, <laughs> I will take that profit with a big smile. Definitely. It's Izzy's biggest buy, the Chatelaine Clip Spectacles Case Collar, which is missing its case. Eek. Shall we say £10 only for that? For a tenner to get me oh, going? Oh, no. I don't think I There's only watch. a substantial part missing. Ten pounds were bid online. You didn't mean thank to say you, that, sir. <laughs> Any advance on this one then, and it sells at ten pounds. I mean, <laughs> it could have been worse. <laughs> Not quite what you had in mind, but worth a try. We're going to just have to go extra hard on the next um, buying stage. We are. I think we've just been a bit too relaxed and having too much fun. Game is on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> She's back in front and up next, the Art Deco Apern. So this is your big spend? Biggest risk. Wow. Uh, shall we say, two pounds only for this. Two bid online, thank you. It's five and eight now bid. Is it 10 bid? At 10 pounds. Cat must have jumped on the keyboard. At 10 pounds <laughs> will bid. There it is. Are we done? At 10 pounds, fair warning. This could have been two. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the auctioneer seems surprised that he got two. They do say no risk, no reward. Now I think we could be back at even Stevens. <laughs> and finally, it's Izzy's novelty golf-themed sugar bowl. Four? At £10 a bid. 12, who's coming in on it? Bid in the room, sir. £12. 15, 18, bid. 20, 22, bid. 25, 28, bid. 30, 32, bid. <laughs> 35, 38, no more, are you sure? 38 back in, that's the spirit. 38, 40, 42. <laughs> Still going, 42, still going. 45, 48, bid. 50, back online, 55. No more, 50 pounds takes his back. 50 pounds I will sell. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just clapping myself. <laughs> now, that's what I call a hole in one. That saved it. <sighs> it has, hasn't it? I don't think it's got me out of troubled waters, but it's made it a whole lot better. Yeah, you can breathe a little bit easier now. Shall we go for a hearty restorative cup of coffee let's before go. we learn the damage? Let's do it. Come on then, let's go. <laughs> Ishi started with £200 and despite some decent lots, has finished a little down. He goes forward with £151.14. pence. Izzy had a tough day in the sale room too, and her £200 pot has shrunk slightly to £168.56, making her today's winner. It's going to be an interesting week. I don't know if we should be smiling or crying. I'm just glad that we're both kind of in a similar boat. We are. Next on Antiques Road Trip... But I can't work out if they're cows or ponies on the hill, but look, they're on such an angle. I hopes. Cracking schemes. I'm really excited to find this here. And an impossible dream. Mr. Wanacock, can you tell me what to do, please? 